subset called applied ethics, where instead of really asking theoretical questions about uh, what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, how we make moral judgments to begin with, whether ethics or morality can be put on any kind of real foundation. Uh, those would be basically, um, that would be moral philosophy considered generally. Uh, applied ethics is really uh, asking questions about ethical situations that happen in the real world, the particulars uh, of ethics, how we make ethical decisions in particular situations. Um, practical ethics, you might say, or you know, trying to, to, to figure out you know, the, the reasoning process behind making ethical decisions. But within the subset of uh, practical ethics or applied ethics uh, is uh, professional ethics, or it is, it is a subset of, of applied ethics. And, and it's a form of applied ethics that, that um, seeks to explore and lay out uh, certain thoughts and theories about uh, the particular ethical problems and responsibilities that apply to professionals. Uh, in this case, of course, engineering. And, and you know, the, the question of whether or not engineering is a profession is something I would like you to think about because uh, there's a kind of a definition of a profession that is offered by, uh, by Sieghart in the first essay. But let's just talk a little bit about terminology, that word profession and professional. Uh, of course, the word professional, um, in the sort of more common sense, I think, just refers to somebody who does something for a living as opposed to an amateur. For instance, I am a professional teacher. Uh, I may not have any special skills and I may not be particularly good at it, but I'm a professional because I get paid. This is what I do for a living. So there is a way in which I'm a professional and in which anybody who does a certain task or engages in a certain activity not for simply the pure pleasure of it, but for compensation and is recognized as someone who's competent to do it, is a professional. Uh, they're professional athletes, they're professional musicians, they're uh, professional novelists and writers and artists and things like that. And that's a perfectly valid and, of course, everyday use of the word, a sense, everyday sense of the word, perfectly valid. But then there's the, the sense of being professional in uh, the sense of being a member of a profession. And, and there things begin to change a little bit because um, in a certain sense, anybody can be professional as long as they do something for a living. They do it for money, well, amongst other reasons, but at least they do it for money. But there is a sense in which you can, you can only be a professional if you are a member of a profession. And then the question is, what actually constitutes uh, a profession? Um, the easiest answer to that is not to try to define it, but to simply look at the jobs which historically have been recognized as being professions. Uh, historically, uh, in, in Western society, European and American society at least, um, the, the, the professions have been uh, medicine and law, um, sort of most prominently and continuing into the present, sort of recognized professions, but also uh, the military and the clergy. That is, being a, um, you know, a priest, a rabbi, an imam, or wh whatever your particular religion happens to be. Someone who is actually a recognized sort of clergy person, I guess. Uh, and the other jobs like uh, teaching and then libra library science, being a librarian of actually social work have been recognized here and there as being uh, professions. Uh, so we can look to that. I mean, we can, we can ask ourselves, well, what's common to all those, those things? Or, you know, um, what is it about those jobs, I if anything, that actually qualifies them as being different, as being a profession? Uh, I think that we start talking about um, Seekhart's essay. It's, it's particularly valuable in that respect, because not only is he talking about professional ethics and what he considers to be the foundation and, and the reason for something called professional ethics. Uh, it gives you kind of an idea of what a profession is, a kind of a definition of a, of, of a profession um, or what characterizes uh, the professions. And he also gives you an idea of what he thinks ethics is, which is a, a quite uh, valuable thing. So I think that the Seacard essay, especially um, Spike Downey's Criticism of it uh, is uh, an especially helpful 
assay in starting to get your ideas together about you know what a class like this is really about i mean what is a profession first of all and we're sort of asking ourselves whether engineering is a profession but what is a profession and if if they are if there are any special ethical responsibilities that go along with being a professional what are they and what why are they that is what what is their foundation? What is it about being professional, supposedly, that, that, that obligates one to some special ethical duties? So I think it's, it's a quite a valuable essay. Um, and and as, as I said, one of the, one of the first things that he, he does is he, he gives you a sense of what he thinks ethics is. And I don't, my reading of it is that he doesn't actually define ethics. He doesn't say, oh, ethics is the, uh, you know, the, the general inquiry into what's right and wrong or the, the general theory of good and evil or something like that. Rather, it gives you a standard or criterion for judging, you know, what has to be the case in order to be in an ethical situation. That is, what, what sort of situations are those which call for ethical behavior, ethical thinking, or raise ethical issues. And he says something, you know, quite elementary, but I think helpful, and, and that is, that, uh, and you'll see this in the beginning of the essay, towards the beginning of the essay, that uh, ethics is about relationships between human beings. Now, maybe ultimately that the, the ethics extends beyond the human species into other living creatures, and he puts that question aside, and it's not something really that we'll be going into in this course. So for all practical purposes, um, leaving open the question of whether animals have ethical standing, whether they have to be treated as moral creatures. But for all practical purposes, really, uh, we, we have a kind of an idea or, or a, um, a standard, again, a criterion by which to judge, you know, whether we are in, are in an ethical situation. And, you know, first of all, what has to be the case is that we have to have at least two individual human beings uh, dealing with each other. Ethics is about relationships. If you were alone in the world, if you were the only living creature, or at least the only human being in the world, uh, it's doubtful whether you would uh, find yourself in ethical situations because ethics is about relationships. It's about, it's about how we treat other individuals. So um, that's interesting, you know, that is, uh, that, uh, you know, to think about. But, but that, that notion of what ethics is leads into Seekhart's main topic, and that is the idea of professional ethics. So the second thing he says about um, you know ethics being about relationships, being about how people deal with each other, is uh, the second element that has to be in place is that there has to be competition, or there has to be some conflict of interest or some opposition of interest between individuals. So it's, it's been pointed out by moral philosophers that, that if we lived in a world of absolute plenty where everybody got everything they wanted all the time, that much of ethics would go right out the window. You know, uh, that is, uh, if, if, if we lived in that imaginary world, that impossible world, where every, every one of our desires <coughs> we could meet with ease and that everybody could get what they wanted, uh, there'd be no need for ethics. Uh, that is, an ethical situation for Sighart is one in which the interests of individuals uh, clash in which they conflict with each other, in which everybody can't get everything that they want. Um, and why does this set up an ethical situation? Because I individuals then have to make a choice, he says, between selfishness and altruism. That is, doing something for oneself or, or doing something for somebody else. Uh, a selfish act we can define as one which is designed solely to further my interests uh, as an individual. A selfish act is one which I is meant to satisfy one or more of my desires. An, an altruistic act is an act done for the sake of someone else and uh, uh, furthermore an act that's done for the sake of someone else that will in some way or another put a burden on me. That is, will bear some cost for me. Uh, that is, I don't think it would really be altruism if you just did something for somebody else, but I in no conceivable way could it be thought to uh, to cost you anything. That wouldn't be altruism. So Downey's idea is that 
the, the ethical situation is always a situation between human beings, between individual human beings, and that um, it has to be a situation in which the interests of those human beings are not completely harmonious, in which certain decisions, I guess, have to be made about who, who gets their desires met and who doesn't. That's uh, pretty good, I think. You know, I mean, pretty good. Um, I don't know if it's absolutely adequate, but it's certainly something to think about in terms of, of, of what ethics is, what morality is. So how does this relate to professionals? I mean, th that is, what is he getting at here? You know, you know it's pretty, pretty obvious in the reading what he's getting at, and, and that is that professionals find themselves in those ethical situations themselves. Uh, you know, doctors, lawyers, priests, engineers, maybe. We'll talk about that. Uh, but as they find themselves in, in those situations, those ethical situations in which uh, they have to make those choices as professionals, not, we're not talking about in their private lives. You know, we're not talking about what engineers do when they're driving to work or, you know, the, what would an engineer do if his phone rang in a movie theater? You know, do you answer it or do you, are you nice and, you know, go out into the lobby and whatever? I mean, we're talking about in, in, in the practice of their profession, in the practice of their job doing engineering or doing medicine or doing law, that professionals, uh, individuals who, who pursue those careers, they, they find themselves with regard to their uh, employers, their clients, their um, whoever they're doing their work for, uh, they find themselves in those situations. And, and what Seacard insists, uh, and this is something I think you really want to think about, is that the, the professional always chooses altruism. That is, uh, that is, in the practice of their profession, the, uh, the professional uh, can never choose self-interest over altruism. That is, wh whoever it is they're working for, and that is another issue. You know, he's thinking of the classical traditions of uh, professionalism, the professions of uh, medicine and law especially, the idea of the doctor-patient or the lawyer-client or the clergyman and their parishioner, you know, that sort of relationship. But obviously it can be it, it, it can be and really needs to be extended in order to apply to engineers who are not quite always in that sort of situation typically if I'm if I'm right about the practice of engineering. Uh, and that'll become an issue in this class. But the idea is that the, in regards to those other individuals whom they are serving, you might say, Who's, who's, who, who, who they are practicing the profession for, the, the professional must always choose, choose altruism over self-interest, that is, the, the benefit of the other, wh whomever it is that is the beneficiary of, uh, of the work that is being done. Uh, and that's an interesting thing, and we can ask ourselves, you know, why is that? You know, why... Uh, what's the idea here? Why, why do professionals have to be self-effacing in a way? Why do professionals have to choose the good of someone else over their own good if there is a clash, right? Uh, so why don't we do one more video in which we sort of pursue that question in Sieghart and then look a little bit about, you know, Downey's very interesting criticism of the whole thing.